Anyway, um, what happens is you come across the agencies of the state, and this is for the first time people experience the, the state in this form, um, and most notably in kettling, as, um, uh, as I'm sure you've, uh, you've seen. This is a practice by which the police, police will corral a section of the demonstrators and hold them for seven or eight hours, uh, not allowing any out, not, not allowing them any water, keeping them confined and contained, which is, it's a form of summary punishment. I mean, we have to be clear about this. This is people, restrictions of people's liberties, and it's intentional and quite deliberate, and it's meant to uh, be, if you like, the equivalent of being taken away and stuffed in the cells overnight. Instead of doing that, the police you know, concentrate people in a very small area and make life extremely uncomfortable for them. Um, but that form of summary, summary punishment, which um, uh, the students are now learning very rapidly how to uh, undermine, that form of summary punishment does uh, really change people's minds very quickly. As soon as they experience uh, something like that, they are radicalized in a way that's difficult to, to understand if you're not actually there. Now, Artur Janeski, his exhibition of a scene is an, an intriguing one, and it certainly says to me, conveys to me his ambivalence, if you like, about the nature of protest, particularly street protest. Um, I think he's kind of showing, as I understand it, he's kind of revealing the, if you like, the passion and the ecstasy of, uh, of popular protest and how it can be devoted to uh, a number of ends. And you can't necessarily conclude that just because people are out in the streets shouting, that what they're shouting for is something worthwhile, that something that's democratic, or something that's morally justifiable. They could be shouting, um, they could be shouting slogans uh, in favor of Jörg Haidar, or in favor of the UVF. And I can see that. There is a, uh, an ambivalence uh, 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 towards uh, protest, towards this kind of protest. It is an emotional experience. I mean, the other thing that really struck me going back onto one of these, um, and this is actually more than I, I, I recall from being in these kinds of actions in the past, is the sheer emotion of it. When um, you have 50,000 people um, and they start having these sort of roars, it's a bit like a football roar. Somehow it appears in the back and it rolls a bit like a, an oral Mexican wave right across the whole uh, march right to the people at the front. And it's an extremely um, emotional experience and very engaging in a curious way because you really feel part of a community in a, in a, in a form that you don't uh, normally experience except perhaps on the football pitch. And I can see why that is, should be questioned because it has no particular moral or political content in itself. It is uh, a sense of um, a mob experience. However, it is uh, true, I would believe, that uh, sanctioned protest still has an impact, even when it doesn't uh, deteriorate into riots. And I think the political impact of the students' revolt has been very direct and very immediate. And we've seen that the Liberal Democrats uh, have been, have been uh, rocked to the core by this, uh, by this experience, because when they signed these pledges saying, uh, you know, that they were, they were uh, on pain of death, would they ever vote for an increase? in uh, tuition fees. Well, they, they, they thought this was just part of media theatre. They didn't think they were doing anything serious here. This was just a stunt. You know, this was just part of campaigning. But suddenly, when the students came out in the streets, they began to realise that what they, they had, was, had done was give a moral pledge to do something, and they were condemning themselves out of their own mouths because the Liberal Democrats had insisted that they were the only party who could be relied upon uh, to translate promises into reality when they enter office. So it has created a real crisis for the Liberal Democrats and consequently for, uh, for the, the coalition. Um, uh, next week, Vince Cable, the Liberal Democrat business spokesman, is even saying he might not vote for his own policy because this fees policy was his own, which is quite an extraordinary thing, quite an extraordinary admission. And, and here, closer to home, there has been a very important political impact also of these students' actions. Uh, which have been peculiarly effective, I think, partly because there has been an element of, uh, of uh, broken windows, uh, discord, and, and the like, but it hasn't, um, it hasn't been such as to uh, create uh, any you know, serious injuries. So far, no one has been seriously injured by any of these actions, and that is obviously all to the good, but they have been extremely dramatic, and they certainly caught the popular mood. And in Scotland, we have a very interesting position because um, the Scottish... National Party government is, of course, committed to free higher education and has been for the last 10 years. It's been all its uh, 
election manifestos. Indeed, um, they were uh, they were leading figures in the abolition of uh, of tuition fees in, uh, in the year 2000, and they abolished the graduate endowment, which was the last remnant of tuition fees in Scotland after they came to power in 2007. <clears throat> but under pressure from the uh, university vice chancellors, the um, particularly the ones of the ancient universities who are really very keen on this idea of introducing variable fees and the marketization of higher education. Largely under pressure from these uh, very uh, forceful and articulate individuals, the Scottish Education Secretary, Mike Russell, uh, has been forced to you know, fudge the issue a bit and, and, and look at the possibility of introducing some form of fees in Scotland, perhaps under the name of a graduate contribution. Now, this has been moving along uh, very rapidly. Uh, the SNP's game plan had been to wait until after the Scottish elections and then announce then, oh well, we're going to have to reintroduce fees after all, we'll call it a graduate contribution, but sorry, sorry guys, we can't do anything else. And what the students' demonstration, the students' action has done, has di directly fed into the political process, in that that option is now closed uh, for uh, the SNP, they can't keep quiet about it, um, uh, they can't fudge it, and they can't resile. They're now much more than uh, the case with the Liberal Democrats, they are now stuck with their policy of uh, free higher education, and uh, indeed it is a very, a very noble and a very good policy, and one I, and I wholeheartedly support. But I don't think that the principle would have been sustainable had it not been for these student demonstrations, because they forced the issue onto the public uh, agenda in a way which the politicians could not possibly uh, ignore. So there we are. And previous, uh, previous um, uh, actions have had a similarly positive effect. Obviously, the poll tax uh, uh, demonstrations in 1990, actually, they were for far longer than that. They went on from 87 in Scotland because it was in uh, the general election campaign of uh, 1987 that Margaret Thatcher uh, promised Scots that the poll tax would be introduced here a year ahead of England. Uh, we were supposed to, to welcome this as a great tribute to her concern <laughs> for, uh, for those of us north of the border. Um, uh, it, it amounted the most astonishing uh, reaction uh, right across Scottish society. People were, were outraged at the concept of people, you know, the dustman paying the same as the Duke. It led to widespread uh, demonstrations um, throughout Scotland. Unfortunately, it took the, what became known as the Battle of Trafalgar Square before matters came to a head in Westminster, because at that stage all these matters were decided there. It was uh, after the Poll Tax riots in 1990 when uh, uh, the, the large groups of, of poll tax protesters effectively occupied uh, the centre of, of, uh, of Trafalgar Square in, in London and uh, managed to, to fight off uh, the police for some several hours. Now, as a result of that, uh, very quickly, um, there was a reaction within the Tory cabinet and they resolved to abolish the poll tax and replace it with the council tax. Um, it also indirectly led to the fall of Margaret Thatcher herself. Had it not been for her poll tax, had it not been for the huge popular uh, rejection of it, uh, she would almost certainly have remained in office for considerably longer than she did. And it was that which very much led to the um, ministerial revolt that pulled her down. So that was another example. Now, I just want to bring it back to Scotland because I've been asked just to, to briefly uh, map out the crisis of democracy as it's expressing itself here in Hollywood. <clears throat> Interestingly, the, the most longer term political impact of the anti poll tax demonstration was uh, uh, Scottish Home Rule, because it was in that reaction uh, that the campaign, the Scottish campaign to uh, uh, set up the Scottish Parliament was really forged, it was really born, and that's when the coalition of forces ranging right across society from the trade unions to churches uh, through to the political parties and all sorts of civic groups in between were em emboldened really by that uh, reaction to this unjust tax. And they, re they resolved there and then that Scotland had to have uh, its own parliament uh, to defend itself against any future impositions from Westminster such, such as that. Um, it, it didn't happen overnight, obviously. I had to wait until the Tories were completely removed from Scotland um, as they were in 1997 in the general election when uh, the, not a single Tory MP was returned to Westminster. So they were wiped out completely. 
After that, um, Labour came in and Tony Blair honoured the commitment of his predecessors to set the machinery in motion for creating the Scottish Parliament. And, and the Scottish Parliament has, you know, it's very widely criticised and, uh, you know, not least by people like me. And, you know, in many senses, the people involved in it have, if you like, betrayed the civic uh, tradition that, that created it. They've, they've been absorbed into kind of bureaucratic politics, which is uh, so too, too familiar from uh, from what we see south of the border. They haven't really managed to create a new politics. But nevertheless, um, this uh, institution, the Scottish Parliament, which would not have happened had it not been for, um, for uh, the popular protests in the 90s and the, uh, this great uh, civic nationalist movement, if you like, which, uh, which uh, led to the uh, establishment of, of the, uh, the legislation for the Scottish Parliament. It has been, it has been uh, an achievement and there have been great successes. We're inclined to dismiss them. You can go through a lot of the lists, um, you know, the uh, um, ending the detention of asylum seekers' families, land reform in the Highlands, and the um, most ambitious uh, targets for, for reduction in carbon emissions in Scotland in the world, 80% by 2050, free pers personal care for the elderly, uh, the smoking ban, which would not have happened in Scotland, and I don't believe it would happen in England, except certainly not right away, had it not been for the Scottish Parliament promoting that in 2005. Um, proportional representation, the abolition of university fees, uh, it really is a question of what the Romans did for us. And they, the Scottish Parliament did do quite a lot. That, that exercise in civic nationalism was, uh, was a worthwhile and justified, and as I say, it really emerged out of protest. However, it cannot be allowed to remain in that state, and protest will always be required, I believe, to re-energise uh, a de democratic system. Uh, simply because of the experience and the practice of politics, which immediately becomes bureaucratic, it becomes an exercise in managing the state, and the politicians, we see it happening all the time, lose touch uh, with the, their social origins and their political origins, and they become co-opted, if you like, by the establishment, and that's, that's just what's happened with the Liberal Democrats, and they're now suffering the consequences of it. So this has to be, democracy, I think, has to be re-energised. Uh, by popular protest, by popular action, even though these popular actions can sometimes be uh, ambivalent and the Janus faced, if you like, they can be sometimes downright nasty. Uh, we had, for example, two years ago, we had the, uh, the strikes at the Lindsay Oil Refinery, if you recall, at which the, uh, the workers there took up the chant not of education for the masses, but British jobs for British workers. Equi remarks. Uh, made uh, uh, unfortunately by the prime minister. They can be, they can be nasty. There can be um, uh, other uh, exercises. The, the fuel protest in 2000, for example, which is the kind of Je Jeremy Clarkson version of political protest, where you go out and speak to the man, cheaper petrol, cheaper fuel. You know, you can't just you can't just support people simply because they're out with banners, sit standing around braziers and shouting slogans. But nevertheless. On the whole, popular protest is an essential part of, uh, of democracy, essential. Democracy is in crisis, democracy is in crisis here, it's in crisis in Westminster, it has to be in crisis, because that is the dialectic between power and protest, between uh, the establishment uh, and the, uh, the people, and that has to be that way. And uh, just, as, just as Winston Churchill said that democracy was uh, the worst form of government except all the others, I think the same is, is true for protest, that it is the worst form of uh, promoting a cause, of, of creating popular engagement, except for all the others. So, thanks very much.